it's a tremendous personal pleasure for me, a youngster of 30 years in masonry. My name is Jack Kelly, by the way. To interview the only minister of the Lord who has ever served as a Grand Master of Masons of the Most Worshipful Grand Lodge of Texas. Robert the Bruce Brannan, the famous Scot of Texas. Bruce, I know that anyone looking at your lifetime and at your history as an individual has got to wonder, number one, of course, whatever caused you, a minister of the faith, to become a Mason, because some people wonder why ministers would become Masons. But more importantly, as a young minister coming into Masonry, what inspired you to really work in Masonry? But let's start with first things first. As a young man, how old were you when you decided to enter the ministry? Brother Kelly, it's difficult for me to say because my mother said I lined up my little toys and preached to them when I was a teeny brat. I moved from that, of course, as most people did. And after serving in World War I in the Navy as a seaman, came home like most kids did. I wanted to make money. And I uh, trained to be a cotton buyer in which you could make good money in those days. But I was never happy. And I guess I was about uh, nearly 20 years old. I was sitting in my home church, and my pastor spoke on that great text from Isaiah. Who will go for us? It broke me down. Then's when I made my decision. That's a tremendous decision to make for a young man. Not yet reached your majority. Oh, no. Yes. What was your next step then? Well, I, I had four years of college ahead of me. I think you realize that... Uh, it's not done for any other purpose than to prepare a man to properly uh, work out the Scripture more than anything else that he's going to teach. I had to go four years to college and get a bachelor's degree. Then I had three years in a theological seminary where I was going through the learning of the history of religion, learning the history of the church, learning theology, studying more Greek and Hebrew and all that sort of thing. So I was facing a minimum of seven years after I made that decision. I understand that you had a very singular distinction in that seminary, to have been ordained before you actually graduated from seminar. It's a very rare thing in my church. They wait until the man has completed his education. But there was a need for an ordained minister up in the north end of a presbytery, then called Brazos Presbytery, around Hearn and all the Caldwell and those areas. The churches were supplied by minister, uh, students for the ministry. They were not permitted to baptize babies or adults. They were not permitted to serve the Lord's Supper and things of that nature. And the old superintendent of education in those days was not a well man. And he wanted an assistant, as he called it, up in that area of the presbytery. And I was serving the church in Calvert. And uh, by invitation, and I was surprised when the president of my theological seminary there in Austin was glad to let me go. It was something that didn't usually happen. I went to Houston, I thought, just to visit the presbytery. And the next morning, after the presbytery was opened and after the little preliminaries were out of the way, the minutes of the day before were read and adopted and that sort of thing, this dear old doctor got up and he said, I need help. And I move you that the presbytery now examine candidate Bruce Brannan for ordination under the Extraordinary Clause. 
that uh, Presbyterians had privilege to do that for a man who doesn't have these mm -hmm. educational qualifications. Well, they did. And so I assisted. When one of my fellow students needed to baptize a baby or something, he'd come preach for me, and I'd go preach for him and baptize the baby. If it was somebody who wanted to have the communion, I'd go hold the communion for him. He'd come preach for me. And that went on then for another year and a half. When I did graduate from the seminary, though, and went to my first church at Loretta, I insisted on being examined by all of the presbytery on all of the things that would normally be used. So it would be in the record that I had finished my work and had taken my examination to the satisfaction of my presbytery. It's my understanding that it was while you were still really in seminary and a young minister, undergraduate really, That's minister, right. at Hearn or at Calvert, and, or at Calvert just uh, north of Hearn, yeah. a few miles, that you decided to become a Mason. My dad was a Mason. I guess the greatest person ever in my life. I wanted to do everything he did. And then, Jack, I guess I'm cut out of a different piece of cloth. My main work in my pastorate was not sermons I preached, but it was being the pastor of the people of my congregation. And I didn't think that it ought to be exclusively Presbyterians. I wanted to be the pastor of anybody in the community that needed me. The one place where I could meet men of all those faiths was in the Masonic Lodge. And there I got those connections that permitted me to do that sort of thing. That's a marvelous way for a minister to serve both in his ministry and in the ministry of, of, right. of the Lord across the, right. all the spectrum of all religions. That's right. <clears throat> And then, as World War II approached, you went back in the service again. Yes, sir, as a Navy chaplain. And somewhere along this time, you had already served as master of your lodge. Now, where were you master of your lodge and officer and master? I was master of my lodge at Laredo in 1935. Was that Laredo 547? That's right. Uh -huh. <clears throat> That's right. And what year? 1935. 1935. Yes, sir. And then... Were you also appointed district deputy grandmaster out of that same district down there? By grandmaster of uh, uh, Galloway, Galloway Calhoun a year or so later. Uh, that uh, particular uh, time then, after you were district deputy grandmaster, and then you became a candidate for the Grand Lodge in right as the war was really beginning to hum as far as the United States well, was concerned. Well, as far as that was concerned, I was in uniform yes. when I was elected to the South. That was amazing. Now, you were here. Uh, the Grand Lodge was held here in Waco, of course, yes, before, this building, before this building was built. And you were in uniform yes, sir. at the time that you were elected Grand Junior Warden That's of right. the Most Worshipful Grand Lodge That's of right. Texas. And then you served as Grand Master in 1947. Yes, sir. Now, I did not get to serve, actually, the Grand Lodge while I was Grand Junior Warden or Grand Senior Warden. I see. I was in the service all that time. And I guess I'm the only Grand Master that was installed in one of the offices by another Grand Jurisdiction. Where was this? California. The Grand Lodge of California? Yes, sir. My yes. ship was in the middle of the Pacific when Grand Lodge met in Waco. And uh, they voted to move me up, as we, <laughs> we usually do. And Brother Joel P. Lightfoot was the one that said, well, how are we going to install Bruce? And this Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge of California was invited here to be the speaker to this Grand Lodge at that time. And he says, well, I can't tell you what he's doing. I know and when he'll be in San Francisco. But if you pass a resolution, when he does come in, we'll install him. They did. Now, this was as 
what, at what office? Grand Senior Warden. As Grand Senior Warden, That's you right. were installed by the Grand Lodge of California. That's right. Now, did the Grand Master of California install you? The whole body was there. I've never seen anything like it. That was when uh, later Chief Justice Earl Warren was governor. He was a past Grand Master. He was president. They were all there, the whole Grand Lodge. And you were installed as Grand Senior Warden. That That's must right. have been a tremendous thrill. It was. What was your rank in the Navy at the time? At that time, I was still just a senior lieutenant. Senior lieutenant. Now, you were a chaplain? Oh, yes. Navy chaplain. That's right. And on what type of ships? Well, <sighs> my actual service really was just on one I ship. See. It was on one of the big troop converted liners, a troop transport. I carried many hundreds of men. I served at a base in... New London, Connecticut, before that, then later in the Russell Islands in the South Pacific, and wound up my duty in New Caledonia. That must have been fantastic, though, to come back in to San Francisco. Now, had you been apprised by someone that you would be installed into office? No, but I was wondering what was going to happen. But I'd always go to uh, Brother Wilson's office, his grand secretary, a gracious person. <laughs> because my wife knew that if uh, she wanted to get something to me, maybe that the censor didn't read or something, she'd send it to Brother Wilson, and I'd go get it just as soon as the ship landed. That's fantastic. That's when I found out. You've absolutely got so many unusual experiences, it's hard to re re really understand how to begin and how to end. <clears throat> Brother Kelly, somebody asked me not long ago, I think it was, I had a party in the lodge on my 81st birthday. Would you like to do it over again? I said, no, I couldn't crowd it all in. And then, uh, as Deputy Grandmaster, you were installed back here in Waco. That's right. And by that time, you were out of the service? That's right. I see. Well, actually, I was back in the inactive status, you see. see. My commission was in the Naval Reserve mm -hmm. of many years before World War II. Right. And then in 1947, in December, yes, sir. you became, what was your number? What, uh, the, do you recall what oh. the Grand Lodge number was? No. 19, <laughs> 1947. Though. Yeah. <clears throat> As Grand Master, what was your greatest thrill? I guess the fact that we reported the greatest increase in membership in this Grand Lodge that it ever had and has ever had since. That's another record that you hold. That's right. Isn't that? I attribute that, of course, to uh, men coming home from yes. the service who uh, saw masonry in action in our many Masonic clubs and things, <clears throat> and they began to see that we had something. You were really... As Grand Master, you were really just coming into the period when gasoline and automobiles were once again available. That's right. Now, of course, your travels around Texas were not like our modern Grand Masters that fly across this great state, but you had to drive yes, sir. everywhere you went. Yes, sir. How many miles did you drive that year? I drove 67,000 miles within the confines of Texas and 13,000 miles outside of the state of Texas. That's incredible when you think about those miles today, of course, we probably travel as far, but we do it a lot a easier. A lot easier than you do. and faster. And right. let me tell you a cute one. I was invited to El Paso Lodge because of some big anniversary, and right, frankly, I still don't remember which one, Brother Kelly. And I had a day in between, and there was a little lodge called Fort San Saba. I know where they it is. had built a new building. They wanted it dedicated. Usually I carried someone with me, but on this particular trip I was alone because of the three-day thing. Well, when I hit El Paso after two days getting out there, the first thing they did was put me in a car and I had to see everything in El Paso and everything over in Juarez and all like that. And I was really tired when I got up at night to make a talk. I don't know whether you'd call it dishonest or not, but I just didn't say that I had a day off the next day, and I just thanked them, and they came down and had breakfast, and I hit the highway. I came to a little town out there in West Texas. We won't call the name because it could be embarrassing someday. And there was the first new tourist court I guess I'd ever seen. 
and I drove in, and a very dear little old lady was there, and I said, Lady, do you have a room for today and tonight? Oh, yes. So I checked in, and I went down to my room, and there was a chance to lay out a lot of work, correspondence and stuff that I'd do, and I just having a big time, and I happened to reach over for the roster. And their lodge was meeting that night. And it said that they met at 8 o'clock. Well, I had my little supper. I found out where the lodge was, and I went up there. There was a dear old cowboy, Tyler. He had muddy boots. I knew he was a working cowboy, and he had his feet across in front of him in a chair. And here was the door. And I walked in, and I said, uh, my brother, is this the Masonic Lodge? He said, yep. I said, you, are they meeting here tonight? Yep. I said, well, have they already opened? Yep. Well, I said, the <laughs> roster said 8 o'clock. That's summertime. <laughs> That's all I'd gotten out of him up to that point. I said, will you please alarm the Lodge and tell the the uh, deacon that the Grand Master wishes to enter. Now, did you have your regalia with I you? I had my regalia in my hand. Mm -hmm. He didn't knock at the door or anything. He just threw that door open. He hadn't even moved his feet. And I'll tell you, this takes the wind <laughs> out of your sails. If you're getting pretty high because you're the Grand Master, brother, it goes down because... He just yelled in there, there's a bird out here says his grandmaster wants to come here. <laughs> there's a bird out here. Yeah. That was my introduction to that lodge. Did they receive you with full well, private grand honors? Fortunately, the master was here at my installation. And when that boy yelled at me, he looked out that door and saw me, he jumped that hijack off his chair. <laughs> and he pulled that thing that... Uh, as we know, is not ritual in Texas. He dropped his gavel. The lodge will stand at ease. <laughs> and he came tearing out there. Well, they pulled it out of me how to officially receive a Grand Master because they'd never had a Grand Master. But I never will forget that. That was the best treatment I ever had for egotism. <laughs> a drop-in visit by a Grand Master. That's right. I suspect there have been a few others that were almost as bad with other Grand Masters. But, uh, oh, I'm sure uh, that. But I'm sure that. I, I doubt sincerely that any the of them hearts just were just as threw big. a door open and said, there's a bird out here who claims he's the Grand Master. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I imagine that year, though, driving all over right after World War II, with the influx of new members, there must have been a lot of tremendous experiences, though. There was. And, Jack, if you turn to the proceedings of my year. You'll find that uh, old Dr. Ross down south of Austin yes. was chairman of the Grand Officers Committee. And he said two things I'll never forget. He said, with all of his educational qualifications and everything, he has the Grand Master of the Little Lodges. He's gone to more Little Lodges this year than anyone else. And I did every time I had a chance. I went. Lodges that had never had a grand officer, except maybe a district deputy. Yeah. And the other thing was, he said, wherever he goes, he's not right worse. Well, he's just Brother Bruce. That's the greatest compliment you can receive. That's really. right. Yeah. Now, as a past Grand Master, you moved into a field that I know that was intriguing to you. Uh, Fraternal relations. Yes, sir. Uh, did you go into fraternal relations immediately after you became past grand master, or was that over a period of a number of years? I had a part of it before I and see. then after. Mm -hmm. And I know you were associated in uh, fraternal relations because I've read many, many of your fraternal relations reports, and I suspect that was a, uh, an experience of great satisfaction to you. Satisfaction and great love because uh, it revealed masonry in operation around this wide world. And your signature is imprinted upon the transactions and the proceedings of many, many Grand Lodge, uh, Grand Lodge meetings that we have had because of your experiences in fraternal relations. Yes, and now I come to an area that I'm personally interested in. Here, the 
your travels outside of this great state of Texas. We've talked about your travels inside the state as Grand Master. I know, for example, that the Masons of Louisiana, the Masons of Mississippi consider you almost a, a native member of both of those Grand Lodges. Uh, and before we get to another great Grand Lodge and another great country outside of the United States, how about talking for a moment about Louisiana and Mississippi and your experiences over there? Louisiana is a great Grand Lodge. They have their own way. It's a great experience to go year after year after year. And frankly, I look forward to those two annual visits because it's almost like a family reunion. How many years have you been attending those Grand Lodges? Oh, well over 20 years, 25, 6, something like that. And all in sequence, too. I think there's been maybe one skip, but something like that. No more than that. And to go to Mississippi, brother, is an experience. Now, you talk about Southern hospitality. My blessed wife's maternal family grew up in North Mississippi. Her ancestors are buried in old cemeteries up around Pontotoc and up in there. And one of the cutest things I guess ever happened was those dear old past grandmasters' wives, some of the first times over there, got to pumping her about who her people were and where they lived and the cemeteries where they're buried and everything. And finally one dear old, old lady, past grandmaster's wife, says, Honey, if they were white, you were kin to everybody in North Mississippi. <laughs> So we sort of have that relationship. Yes. And then they totally surprised me uh, several years ago. They don't elect a deputy grandmaster. The office is left open, and the grandmaster is permitted to appoint his dearest old buddy if he's a past master. And he becomes a deputy grandmaster. And occasionally, some three or four times in the passage of history, the Grand Masters died, and the deputy took over, just like one in our Grand Now, that deputy Grand Master, though, doesn't normally, uh, uh, is not, not normally elevated to no, the no, office No, no, he's not elected. That's, yes. that's it. I think the Grand Lodge of Iowa has yeah. a similar. Well, anyhow, <coughs> Mississippi has in their law, their code, that uh, any Mississippi Master Mason, for good and sufficient reasons, and by unanimous consent of the body, may be named an honorary past Grand Master. So that excludes every uh, Mason outside of Mississippi. Fifty years ago, they wanted to do something for the birds from outside. Mm -hmm. So they amended the law by simply saying, any Master Mason with sufficient qualification for good and sufficient reasons, and by the unanimous consent of the body, may be named an honorary life member of the Grand Lodge. And in 50 years, they've done 10. And you are one of the 10? There are three living today. A dear old past Grand Master from Alabama, and one from Tennessee and myself. The three of them. And they insist that we receive all the perquisites and everything of a past Grand Master. So you are, uh, you, the three of you, are able to attend each Grand Lodge session? That's right. We call it the smallest Masonic club in the world. Sol <laughs> the smallest Masonic club in the world. I want to, you mentioned your great wife, and I think it would be unfair to the Masons of Texas and to this interview if I didn't ask you to talk about that lovely lady for a little bit, where you met her, and, and uh, she, I know you said her family comes from northern Mississippi, but uh, she's been such a tremendous inspiration to you and yes. so many of the rest of us that uh, discuss her for a few moments. Yes, sir, the mother of our five children. She was content to be that. For some reason, it bore in on her soul that she was never a club woman. She devoted herself to these children. And you can't help but love a mother that'll do that. I met her, sir, when she was a college professor. She was a professor of Romance Languages in the little Arkansas College in Batesville, Arkansas, that I attended and received a Bachelor of Arts. 
She came along about the third year that I was there, and I told you a while ago I was a GI in World War I, so I was older than the average male student, and the co-eds were just little kids to me. But I saw this lovely professor, and uh, she was kind enough to go places with me, and I still tease her, and I can get a little blush out of her right now, Jack, because I say we went to a picture show one night, and it was a scary sort of picture. And her hand was kind of on the arm, and I reached over and took her hand, and she didn't withdraw it, and that night I went home and proposed. That was all the encouragement I'd had. <laughs> <laughs> that she had held her hand. That's right. It's a considerable difference from the modern oh, uh, brother. Yes, sir. society. Yes, sir. <clears throat> how long? How many years have you now been married to this lovely lady? We were married in 1926. 1976, the bicentennial year, you observed your 50th wedding anniversary. That's right. Right. And so now we have five more years of That's 55 right. years. To That's marry. right. That's great. How many grandchildren do you have? I have 11. 11 grandchildren. Two grandsons and nine lovely granddaughters. That's tremendous. That's a tremendous family. Two of my sons have followed me in the ministry. Two of them are members of the fraternity. Where are your sons uh, uh, who are ministers? Where are they located? The older son, Bob, is at Farmington, Missouri. And the other son is now north of Bossier City, Louisiana, developing an entirely new work in an area called Benton. Now, did they both enter the Presbyterian ministry? Oh, yes. Uh, yes. I see that. Jack, I think the Lord controls the Every one of them married a Presbyterian girl. We haven't had any problems. Isn't that amazing? That's, that's right. That's marvelous. And we have two lovely daughters, one in California and uh, one down in Aransas Pass. That's, that's marvelous. And uh, we don't have any religious problems there. So we're very fortunate. I want to get back to the part of your Masonic life in particular in which you have traveled outside of this state and outside of these United States. As we call you our resident Scotsman, <laughs> Robert Bruce Brannan, when was you, wh what was your first visit to Scotland? What year? 54 and 5 when I went to do a study, a postgraduate study in uh, New College, which is the College of Divinity of the Edinburgh University. You spent about a year there at that time? A little over a year. And I've heard a few of the stories that you've told of the tremendous hospitality, the tremendous rapport that you established with the, Scot the Scots and the, and the Masons of Scotland. Jack, the man with the most amazing mentality, uh, remembrance, that recall was the Grand Master Ceremonies of the Grand Lodge of Scotland, a man named Charlie Burroughs. Same thing as a certified public accountant in the United States, and he had a large business. We sat, the first time I visited Grand Lodge there, at a quarterly session, like we're sitting here. In a few minutes, he had where I was born, my military service, all of my education with my various degrees and things, then my Masonic service and all that sort of thing. He did not write down one note. And when they carried me into that Grand Lodge and I stood before the altar as we receive our visiting brethren, Charlie Burroughs recounted everything he had pulled out of me right down the line. Well, of course, he hammered that Robert Bruce pretty heavy. And the old Lord MacDonald, the great old Lord of the Isles, was Grand Master. And I was escorted on up then to his station, and he greeted me very cordially, and then pointed down in the front row to a row of chairs. And there was an empty seat. He says, we've reserved that seat for you. Will you please go occupy it? There was a lovely little Scot sitting right by me, not a very large man. I later found was the Earl of Elgin and Kin Carden. He was a past Grand Master and Mr. Mason of Scotland. I don't know how long he was the head of the Knights Templar. He was the head of 
the Royal Order of Scotland, and you just name it. And when I sat down, he said to me, he said, Dr. Brandon, did your mother just like the name Robert Bruce, or does it have a family connection? Oh, I said, I've, I, I, I've got a grandmother named Bruce. What? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And her mother was named Bruce. Huh? He said, do you know where they were from? I said, my mother's youngest brother kind of ran it down, and a little old place called Aragi up near Loch Ness, where Nessie lives. He said, do you have any names and things? I said, not with me, but I do have at the flat where I'm staying. He said, would you let me see them? I said, give me your address and I'll mail them to you tomorrow. It was just a sheet of paper or two with a few names. Next time I saw Lord Elgin, he says, we're kinfolks. He was the head of the clan, Bruce. And you, he, hadn't, he didn't tell you this when he was in that first conversation? Oh, no. He wanted to see this information. And from then on, I guess it was impossible for them to show me any more honors than they did. There's two or three experiences that you had over there that I'd like to have you mention. One, uh, the Texas Freemason of a number of years ago uh, held, had a picture of you and a group of the Scott Mason, a Scottish Mason, Masonic officials. Uh, observing, I, I think perhaps you should describe your experience over there in locating and uh, placing a marker or a stone uh, with uh, commemorating our great Grand Secretary of Grand and, Lodge of Texas who past, died over and there. And past Grand Master. Uh, would you like to Roosevelt. talk about that for a moment? Yes, sir. I guess one of the most beloved Grand Masters and past Grand Masters we ever had was our dear old judge in Austin that lived to be nearly a hundred years old. Brother McClendon had under his mind to see that every Mason who had served as Grand Master had a marker. And those that already had markers would permit, the family would permit us to engrave on it Grand Master of Masons in Texas in the year. Well, here was Brother Ruthven, who was a Scot, who had gone to Scotland to visit some family after a passage of many years and was on his way back to the United States when he got to Glasgow where he was taking a ship and it was one of those periods of plagues and he got the plague and was died and buried. And when Brother McClendon found out that I was going to Scotland, he put upon me to try to find where he was buried and to place a suitable marker. And I wrote to the great grand secretary, whom I dearly loved. This was after I'd been to school over there. I see. And uh, I asked Dr. Buchan to uh, see if they could find where he was buried. And there was a section of this Glasgow cemetery there by the side of the great old cathedral for sojourners, people passing through, they knew that he was buried there. At one time it belonged to the church, then the church couldn't keep it up and they formed a society and that society went out. In other words, it had passed through a number of hands and it finally reached the point and they said it must have been about there because we knew the year he died. Must about there. And they had a provincial grand secretary that didn't give up. And he kept pushing. And even after that marker was engraved and set, he found the old records that showed exactly where it was. I said a while ago how the good Lord has his hand in things. Half of that marker was on his grave. Well, you know, I had the privilege of seeing that marker in 1979. I went over, had a great deal of difficulty in that little hill behind yeah. the cathedral there. Finally located it, yeah. and it's, in, it's a part of this slide presentation that I showed the yeah. Masons of Texas right. last year. Uh, that, uh, to me, was a tremendous experience. 
Ruthven was grandmaster in the 1840s. Yeah. I, I can't recall specifically yeah. the year. And, of course, I think most Masons who are acquainted with the proceedings of the Grand Lodge of Texas are acquainted with the fact that Ruthven's reprints That's right. are really the only record That's right. that we have of the Grand, early, early of the Grand Lodge right. during the period of the 1850s right. and the early 1860s during That's the right. Civil War. That's right. There's Jack, another. talking okay. about travel, let me get yes. one thing in here before we go any further. When I went to Laredo in 1928 for my first pastorate, and they finally broke a little trail through to Monterey, I went to Monterey with some of my friends. Oh, we wore out a set of tires. That's how <laughs> rough and everything. And we got to the old Ancira Hotel, and they were still in the main dining room and things. The signs were the horseshoes of old Pancho Villa's horses that were stable in the dining room would crack the floors. <coughs> and the brother masons would slip up to you and give you the little signs. You couldn't hold communication. And I don't know, that sort of touched my heart. I had read and had been taught that masonry was a universal brotherhood. And there were brothers that I couldn't communicate with. I had no dream of ever being Grand Master Masons in Texas at that time, Brother Kelly. I had long 29, 30. And I somehow took a vow that if the good Lord ever gave me an opportunity, I'd try to do something about that. So working through a great past Grand Master of uh, one of the Grand Lodges in Mexico, and also the great York Grand Lodge, some of the past yes. Grand Masters. We held a conference in Monterey where seven Grand Masters, Grand Secretaries, and Committee Chairman of Fraternal Relations met. We met for about two or three days. That must have been another first for you. We had all. We had 63 Masons and their wives. That's <coughs> a big crowd. And we left Laredo in a caravan. The consul at Laredo was a mason in Saltillo. Of course, we couldn't communicate, but he was a very dear friend. And he got me to get all the names of those going and the numbers of their automobile motors and all that <coughs> sort of mess. I wish you could have seen the red book that he had. We didn't have to have those car permits. We didn't have to have those car tarjetas, as they call them, yeah. for immigration. It was all in this book. All in it. And it's the only book I ever had that was sealed up in red tape. And I want you to know that the Mexican government had a major in the Army sitting there waiting for us when we came across the bridge at Laredo. They waved us through customs. Not a single car was checked. He escorted us into Monterey. You've never seen anything like it. And we just had one bowl, one party right after the other, and we straightened out a few things. I'd like to say this. I don't think this would be wrong on tape. They didn't use the Bible. They thought it was the book of another church that fought masonry. They didn't realize that there was a Douay version in Spanish, yes. which is the version of the Roman Church, nor the King James Bible were entirely different. I was sort of prepared for this thing. The Douay version, when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost and the crowd said, what must we do to be saved? Peter said, do penance and be baptized. The King James says, repent and be, Repent and be baptized, right. And it was my privilege to show those grandmasters <coughs> this King James Version is just as precious to us and should be to you as this one is to them. And I just cleared that thing up without the trouble. No use going into a lot of other things. They had to remove the charters from some lodges in Texas. But when we met here in the old temple in December, Judge Marcus Weathered, who was chairman of Fraternal Relations. I remember Marcus Weathered. You remember, Weathered. brother.
the old Hamburg hat. Just as soon as we had the resolution for the seating of Brother Master Masons, I called on Brother Weatherick for a partial report of the Committee on Fraternal Relations. And he went through all those whereases. And delegations from seven Grand Lodges in Mexico came into our temple. That was one of the greatest days of my life. That hand across the border has been extended down through the years a lot more effectively because of that beginning. Well, again and again and again we've had other conferences. Yeah. I've been down a number of times, bless their hearts. And just today the Grand Master and Deputy Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Tampa, Tom Alipas, demanding right. that I be down there in March this year. They had voted me an honorary membership, and they say they have a jewel prepared, but I've never been able to go get it after all these years. That's marvelous. But they says they want to do it. Now you go on with what you're talking about. There's another area that I want to get back to because as a member of the Royal Order of Scotland, I'm extremely interested in your experiences with the Royal Order of Scotland. I happen to know that you are the only American to be a full-fledged member of the Grand Lodge of the Royal Order of Scotland. How did that all come about and your association with the Royal Order? Well, Jack, you almost have to be nobility to be Grand Master over there. And the mere fact that I'd served this Grand Lodge, they just kind of picked me up and put me up on that high shelf at where I didn't belong. But it did introduce me I to these lovely that. people. And I mentioned the Earl of Elgin a while ago, and he was also the head of the Royal Order. I had been elected to receive it, but I had a bunch of children in college, and it was costly, you know. And uh, many of my children have advanced degrees and things. I uh, I just didn't have the money to fly to Washington and pay the, and I never done it, but I'd been elected. So somebody got the idea of writing to the Grand Lodge and informing them that I'd been elected in the Provincial Grand Lodge of the <coughs> United States, and would they please confer it by courtesy, which they had never done. I reached there in August, and they talked to me about it. This lovely Dr. Bachin that I just mentioned yeah. that was the Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge was also the Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge of the Royal Order. We talked about it again and again, what it meant. On February the 22nd, I had been there from August to February, they decided they could do it. And uh, uh, after I had received it that night and Lord, all that nobility conferring it, and it was. In every chair, some man had a title. Oh, it was a wonderful night. They called the other two candidates up before the altar with me and presented them their patents. And Lord Elgin says, Dr. Brandon, yours will have to be sent to the United States because uh, you're a member of the Provincial Grand Lodge, and it'll have to be signed by... Brother Fowler and so forth. I, Thank you, sir. In fact, sat down. They completed their business and about ready to close, and he turned to the marshal and asked him to present me at the altar. Up to that time, Brother Jack, I guess anywhere and on the average of two, three times each week, I was visiting some Masonic body. Yeah. As you know, I'm eligible, and then they're ever right and everything. We haven't even tried to explore that. And if we had a good Scotsman to come over here and could tell a few cute stories and things like that, you'd, we'd work him to death, and they were doing that to me. And when I stood there in front of that altar, old Lord Elgin says, Dr. Brown, you've been so generous with yourself. And we feel like you've become one of us. The Grand Lodge has voted you membership in the Grand Lodge if you will accept it. That's incredible. It is incredible. I knelt at the altar and took a little obligation. And it's the only real sheepskin parchment that I ever received. 
member of the Grand Lodge of the Royal Order of Scotland. And I'm the only American to have ever had it. Yes. And the time before conferring that on me was on King Edward, Victoria's son, when he was the Prince of Wales. They yes. don't throw it around. That is truly incredible. Yes, sir. Now, was it in that connection or as a result of your visits to the Grand Lodge of Scotland that you actually have become a permanent contributor to the museum of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. I walked into that museum in 1979 and I asked the Grand Secretary, I said, I'm sure you're acquainted with our past Grand Master, Reverend Dr. Bruce Brannan. Oh, they went into ecstasy about you and your visit over there. And then I, he said, would you like to see uh, our museum and his contributions to it. And I went and I found out that we have a living past Grand Master whose personal belongings are in that museum. Tell me about that. Brother Kelly, our Grand Masters put out a metallic token every mm -hmm. year. I always ask for two, and I send one to the Grand Lodge of Scotland. And uh, a number of years ago, a friend of mine had quite a large box of uh, badges and things that had been at various grand encampments and something like that. that and uh, he didn't know what to do with it. And I, they didn't want it here at the Grand Lodge. He tried to give it to the museum. They didn't want it. So he said, could you do something with it? Well, that was one of the times that I was going to Scotland. I said, give it to me. I'll take care of it. And boy, they were glad to have it. Yes, they were very proud. And every time I can get a little something, if I visit another Grand Lodge and they give me something, I ask. I'm mean enough to ask for another one to send to Scotland. And uh, they have an apron, past Grand Master's apron that I wore before it got so bad, and they've got a bunch of other things. That, yeah. Yeah. Now there's one other little area of your association with Scotland I want to discuss, and that's this last visit you made. The Grand Master of Scotland last year was a lovely person, and uh, I was writing him and had received a letter from him in which he said, I doubtless suppose you have heard from the young Earl of Elgin in Kincardine, a lovely young man who bore the title of Lord Bruce as long as the dear old Earl I knew. And eventually he says, quit calling me Lord Bruce. My name's Andrew. Lovely young man, about the same age as my older son. And the Grand Master said, he's been appointed the Lord High Commissioner to the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, which is the Presbyterian Church of Scotland. You apologize, you're not a Presbyterian in Scotland. <laughs> well, almost in the same mail, it wasn't but a day or two later, here came a letter from Andrew saying that he had the appointment and that he would take up residence in the uh, Queen's Palace, Holyrood House Palace in Edinburgh. I'm acquainted with it. For a period of at least a fortnight, maybe more. And how delighted he'd be if Margaret and I could come and be entertained. I wish you could see Margaret's face when she read that letter. She simply said to me, can we? I said, honey, I've already called the travel agent. I know how much it'll cost to get us over there and back, and I'm going to dress right quick and go see my banker, who is a dear, dear friend, a very active mason, all rights and all the honors. And I showed him the letter. He looked across his desk. He says, you're going, ain't you? I said, that's why we're here. And... Uh, we figured out how I could get the money. And then I had to buy it by a certain date to get this cheap fare. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
When I went back on that date, I had that paper that he'd given me with everything on it. And I said, here's the paper. i got to buy the ticket today. And you know he tore that paper up. And I said, wait a minute. You mean I can't go? And he opened that drawer over his knees and threw a brown envelope and in currency was a fare. And I said, wait a minute. He said, you don't know how many friends you have in this Dallas area. I was hoping you'd mention that. And Margaret got to sleep in the queen's beds and eat off the queen's china and dry her hands on the queen's linen. and Just one of the greatest things that happened to the two of us. <coughs> that must have been a tremendous experience. I think he wants us to cut off. Uh, are we going to need to reduce this? Okay, we've got about five minutes left, uh, Bruce, before we're going to have to end this interview. I could sit here and talk to you until the 